On today's Running Channel podcast, we're going to talk about how long running shoes actually last, whether that's the different types of foam that they use, whether they're super shoes, the carbon plate, all of those different things, and how many miles you're actually going to get out of them. We're also going to talk about our news stories and answer your questions. You are listening to the Running Channel podcast with Rick over there pressing buttons, me, Sarah Hartley, and Andy Badley, my co-host. The reason I've done it in a very weird order is because it's birthday week for me and Andy. Yeah. Woo. Oh, well, <laughs> gosh. Birthday You're more excited week. about this than, than I, yeah, I think this. I'm way more excited You two you share are. a birthday week. Yeah. yeah with it, we're only three, well, day, three days apart and... Oh, um, definitely not in actual years. age. <laughs> <laughs> Which is quite funny that we're talking about running shoes today. Have you, I mean, how long, how long do how, I last? How, how long? <laughs> <laughs> now that is a leading question, uh, depending on how euphemistic you want to be. Happy birthday, you two. Here's Thanks. the podcast. So how's everyone's weeks been? Hot. Ooh, hot. Still hot. Yeah. So last week's podcast was really useful to look back and listen to myself on how to run an eight. <laughs> how many fans have you bought since last week? <laughs> well, have you ever actually bought subscribers? <laughs> oh, brilliant. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's not going to buy any fans, Andy. It's not January. Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yeah. We've got uh, just one, months. just one, just okay. one. We're cool, we're cool. Excellent. But speaking of considering it's our birthdays this week, I want to talk about, have you ever done anything running related on your birthday? Like specifically for your birthday? No. Well, that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> right, you clearly right. have. Go on, hit me with your story. Well, no, because every year I see people who do run... The, as like run as many kilometers or miles as you are years old which yeah, obviously me and Rick for you, are struggle with that. you'd be out all day <laughs> <laughs> Rick, but, don't tie me with your brush you're the old one I <laughs> but i so i'm turning 25 this year so oh. i've still got it within my wheelhouse but i'm currently doing a 30 day challenge so and i can't do any extra miles yeah so instead i'm doing a fun challenge where on friday i'm going to go out in a field because i'll be at my parents oh just stop and stare at the field no so, so get up. no no no, oh. no i'm gonna draw my age I'm going to do a bit of Strava oh, art. Oh, a bit of Strava art. Yeah. thing oh. is, though, this idea of running <laughs> your age. So when you get to, you know, 75, I can't imagine on my 75th birthday, I fancy cracking out 75 miles. 75 minutes, though, maybe. Minutes. Oh, yeah, I'm thinking minutes. I, could do, I could do 41 minutes. Seconds. Yeah. Seconds would be good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've got to save myself this week. We're, we're out filming. A, I've got to try and run a 10K and commentate on it whilst running it live, one take. Oh, really? Um, on What's Wednesday, this for? Yeah. Um, for? It'll be a video on YouTube where it'll be me talking you through how to run a sub 45 minute 10K. Whilst wow. running Whilst a sub 45 running. minute 10K. We did yeah. it for 5K and it yeah. went so well that we thought, why not up the yeah, stage? Roll me out again. Yeah. <laughs> roll, roll Andy out. Happy birthday. Like, right, Andy, this week you're going to run this. Off you go. <laughs> yes, that's, that's a little bit how it goes. Have you done it, Sarah, on sub 45? Yeah, once. Yeah, I thought so. On a track. Yeah. I'm yeah. not joining Andy this week. What time do you reckon you could do it in Andy now? Uh, under 40 minutes, yeah. so somewhere between 36 and 37 minutes, probably. Oh, you know when you get genuinely excited about one of our videos about watching it? I can't wait to see this. It, that is really good. <laughs> and we're, Obviously, possible. the whole video isn't going to be the full 45 minutes long. That'll we're be a put, long watch. Yeah. We're going to put fun little speed ups, though, so you will. Yeah. we are doing it all in one go. Yeah, I've got to give a commentary as I go, and the idea is that I have experience in, in running at that level and thinking about what you might want to be focused on, whether that's your running form, ways of distracting yourselves from the fact that it gets quite difficult if you mm. are trying to run a PB mm. or if it's the furthest you have ever run. Um, so yeah, all of the things that you can think about at the various different points. Um, and if you're thinking, oh, Andy always makes it look easy. He's not going to be running it like I am. Don't worry, because we've thought of a solution to that. And that's also a future video coming soon. Oh, have we? Do I know about this? Yeah, you do know about this. Okay, right. I've okay. probably just said it too cryptically for you to <laughs> yeah, work, out. work out. What it so is. should we talk about what we're talking about this week? Yeah, I'm really excited about this. So how quickly should running shoes wear out? The reason I'm excited is because 16 years ago, I bought a pair of running shoes for my mum's house. Uh, which I visit at Christmas. <laughs> for you, I'm sorry, I'm just imagining yeah. your run, mum's for, house running. For, for, my, for Christmas and Easter, so I didn't have to bring back a pair of running shoes right, 250 yes. miles north every time I make the trip. So it's you, just extra stuff. So yeah. I've left those running shoes at my mum's house yeah. since, what, 2007, yeah. I think they've been yeah, there. Yeah. And they, 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 get, they get a couple of runs, they get a few runs out, you know, Easter and Christmas every year. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So... Are those shoes now dangerous and likely to cause me an injury? As in, you're or still, are they okay? You're still wearing them now. Yeah. So when I go back for the you're Open Championship golf yourself. in July, when I get, I'll be, I am dangerous. <laughs> uh, 
That sounds so dodge. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when I go back for the Open Championship, I'll probably run, what, I don't know, three, four, five times in that week in, in, in July. Yeah. But th this is the 17th year. They still feel good. Maybe a, a touch unstable at times. Um, but are they okay to use? No. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> no, next, move on. Interesting. Well, look, the, I mean, loads of things at play here. And, and this is a really complicated topic. So um, there's, a, there's a classic thing that gets kind of reeled out. And it's probably something that we've said on, on the channel before with a, a caveat, but often that gets taken out of context. And then people quite rightly will get annoyed about the generalization of, say, 300 to 500 miles for a pair mm. of shoes. It's very individual. And we definitely wouldn't encourage people to be rotating through shoes or throwing them away for the sake of it, particularly in the world we live in now in terms of being as conscious as we should be about the environment and sustainability. But there are also potential biomechanics and then ultimately injury implications to continuing to run in shoes when they are past their best. So it's it's there's loads of things that will factor into it. The key thing that's probably at play here isn't the distance that you've run in the shoes. It's just how old they are. And foam, certainly older foams, to my knowledge, degrades over time. So the midsole, really? what it's physically made of will be significantly less cushioned than it was when you bought them even if you hadn't run in them a day between now and 2007 well it um, would have degraded naturally just yeah. by lying there yeah wow also surely it must feel so different going from because you run in like quite cushioned quite high stack height shoes yeah going from that i, I, run, I run in the high heels of trainers yeah. you know, te <laughs> technology's changed so much in that yeah years. yeah Okay, so maybe it's time to upgrade my uh, pair of uh, running shoes in my mum's garage. Tell you what, order a new pair to her yeah. house and then maybe... Get maybe another 16 years out yeah, of no, I was going to say, out. maybe rotate every like two to three, four I, to five. I suppose that's a really good point, isn't it? Because the technology in running trainers um, in, in the last few years has just sped up at a incredible rate to what it was doing before so the last where we were where we are now compared to two years ago mm. is almost the same as much as two years ago to 10 years ago because they've developed so much yeah i'd agree with that i think from say 2000 2010 there wasn't or it didn't feel like it when i was running at that level that there was this huge step change at any point like things got lighter and trends came in and out as to whether mm. it was going to be liked by being really minimalist and almost barefoot um, or whether it was then it started shifting towards slightly newer foams in the early 2010s. But yeah, now in the last four or five years, shoes are unrecognizable to what they were. So that's another thing probably, like just in your very, very unique instance there, is running in the more modern foam shoes and then going back to the older shoes. Not only will the foam have degraded, but like mechanically it will be used to different things now. So um, certainly I've been speaking to coaches recently who worry sometimes when they're coaching people, a little bit like me and Sarah, who will test a lot of, different running shoes yeah whether that's actually slightly bad for us because we never settle into something that's well stable and perfect for our own running mechanics would mm. foam degrade at a much slower rate on the newer shoes it's probably too early to say um i was trying to read up on this as much as i could before um before the podcast um but the the new foams haven't been around that long i think mm. most people would still say don't hammer the same pair of shoes every day if you are running you know, four, five, six times a week. If you have a, the luxury of having an extra pair of shoes to rotate um, so that you can, even if they're an identical pair, just to give the foam enough chance to, to recover. But I'm not sure how much science there is in, in that. And then you've got the carbon plated shoes. And I was looking on, and this isn't unique to On, for example, but the On Cloud Boom Echo 3 um, is a new, uh, their new super shoe that's coming out. And on the box, it says good for four marathons. Um, four? Yeah. Um, and it's and I suppose at least they're being over four miles. Yeah. Mm. Wow. It's nothing. But then if you think about it, I think there's such a big disconnect between all of these super shoes are kind of at the forefront being engineered for elite runners and then think about how many marathons they run in a year. Yeah. But then they also might potentially be getting a fresh pair of shoes for every run. But then when you trickle that down to the average runner that might be running four marathons in the space of six months, that's then like, oh, well, am I getting that much? out of my like for my money yeah and, and on just we'll, we do super shoes now and then there was a really sarah asked me a really interesting question that we should come on to which was if you're running faster do your shoes wear out more quickly um mm. so but talking about running faster super shoes i went down a rabbit hole when i was looking into this and there's actually a really cool piece of research by someone called healy and hoog kamer i don't know how you pronounce the second person's name so apologies if they're listening in the journal of sport and health science in 2022 where they would 
because one of the things that could degrade in your super shoes, you've got the foam, you've got the outsole that could wear through to the foam, um, but then you've got the, the physical carbon plate in the shoe and whether that might snap, you know, if you, if you if it potentially degraded to the point where you've worn it so much that it snapped or if you just happen to, I don't know, step on an aggressive curb or something and snap yeah. the plate, does it make any difference? And they actually found no, that in terms of the, the running economy, having a snapped carbon plate didn't actually impair your running economy compared to running in a perfect pair of the same shoes. They didn't, really? the vapor flies. Wow. Yeah. I wonder though, so the vapor flies obviously have this really iconic patented plate shape yeah. and then loads of other shoe companies have lots of different ones. So for example, the on shoe that you just mentioned, that has like two plates, one at the midfoot, one at the How does like, it? Yeah. slightly further back towards the shoe. Yeah, and Adidas has their rods. Adidas has rods. I wonder if, if a rod snaps, yeah, I guess then you've got other rods. But that's interesting that you could yeah, they, have... They made six cuts in the, I think, in the forefoot of the plate. To, really? To see whether, and it like, still didn't make a difference? Completely through it. That's my understanding from reading the paper. Yeah, that, that, but it, and it didn't make a measurable difference in running economy compared to running in a perfect, pristine pair. Um, so that's a total aside. But I still thought it was interesting that people are starting to do that those tests now as to... And it shows how little we understand about the interaction between the carbon plate and the foam as to what actually... Make, helps you run faster in the super shoes. Yeah. What I find really interesting using super shoes in this example is that when you look at like an everyday trainer, it will quite often have an entire outsole, which is there to like protect the shoe. Whereas then when you look at carbon plated shoes, they're quite often so stripped back to make them the light as, as light as possible, yeah. that it means that they're really trying to cut every little thing that you possibly don't need. So if you look at actually the outsole on those, mm. they're only putting kind of bits of rubber or kind of more hard wearing materials where they think you're going to need it. So it's quite interesting looking at how, where they think you're going to strike the ground. Cause I've seen somewhere on the like bit closer to the inside of your foot, yeah. there's nothing on the kind of midsole towards the heel, but then on the other side on your out, out a bit of your foot they've actually yeah. lined all of that i see well it's a bit like when you get out of a swimming pool you see how much of your foot actually touches the ground <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. yeah, it's funny it's a great it is, yeah it's exactly like that but then but then if you're if you're just running purely on like flat pavement or really really groomed yeah i don't know but then if you're running on quite a rocky cobbles yeah your whole you foot is going to hit the ground yeah, yeah or yeah. if you're i don't know smashing into the curb as you come up onto the pavement i feel like you might get Stones yeah, but I suppose that's it. in trainer design, isn't it? So if you're if you're a trail runner, I, I, I trail some train running shoes for us a couple of weeks ago. You can feel they've got a better degree of sturdiness to them mm. on how yeah, they're, they're built. aimed at keeping you sort of yeah. more stable and, and slightly maybe not lower to the ground, but more of a ground feel, so that you can have that proprioception. Um, yeah, I, I I just think it's 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 fascinating. That, like you said, the, the lighter and more expensive, ironically, the shoes get, the probably less durable they are that the rubber that you're talking about or the compound they have as the outsole is thinner or not there at all. So mm -hmm. for example, Under Armour shoes, they they use a particular midsole compound that means the midsole is also the outsole. Um, yeah, that has a massive impact on how quickly things are going to wear down. And I think that's what you need to look for. If you're trying to work out how quickly your shoes are worn out or whether you could keep wearing them, if they have good outsole coverage still, um, then that's a good initial indicator. Maybe that you've got a nice neutral gait and you're not wearing one particular patch away. Okay, but, so but literally by looking underneath the yes, shoe. Yes, exactly. Okay. Look, look at look at your wear pattern on the yeah. the outsole. And most people are wearing everyday running shoes for most of their stuff, so they will have more rubber to play with. But then if there is a patch which is worn through to the the white foam midsole, that's usually white. Um, Time to change. I, I would say yeah. As you get to that point, then the moment that you hit that last little bit of rubber, then all of a sudden the foam is going to degrade super quickly underneath mm. every time you're running. That is really useful. Someone also told me as well that they look at they look at the side of their shoe and whether they're starting to get little creases in the yeah. foam as well. Cause that yeah. shows that it's not quite like springing back to full height. Yeah. My, my 2007 <laughs> pair of New Balance <laughs> definitely aren't springing back. <laughs> they're, yeah. not spring yeah. they're just a pancake <laughs> yeah. on the floor. Yeah. Um, and then part related to that, all of the factors that feature in, in how quickly your shoes wear out was quite Sarah's question, which was, um, do they wear out more quickly if you run more quickly? Mm, yeah. What actually affects it? Well, so, your weight will affect it as, as an individual, as a mm. runner. So how heavy you are must have an impact on the foam of the shoes. So how much, how many times you're going to be able to repetitively hit the ground and get the same kind of response and bounce back from the foam is going to be impacted by how heavy you are. But then not only that, that 
interacts with how you hit the ground. So if you reach out in front of you and you're overstriding and you your heel hits the ground really heavily first and then you spend a long time on the ground, like a long ground contact time, then again, that's going to have a more significant amount of wear on mm. the shoe. So a heavy contact and a long time where the, the shoe is being compressed and then decompressed as you kind of toe off again. What about then, cadence? Yeah, well then equally yeah. though, if you're a fast runner and you've got a very high cadence, mm. then that's going to make them wear out quicker as well because you're you're not necessarily, your ground contact time might be less, but you're hitting the floor more because your cadence is high. Yes, if you've got a high cadence, then you are going to have, you know, for the same number of miles run, the higher the cadence you have, the more times the shoe will have physically hit the ground. Mm. So it's a real hard, this is an impossible question to answer as to which wears it out more. So heavy long foot long foot contact are more likely to wear out the the foam and, and how responsive the shoes feel but then lots of quick um tap 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 fast cadence it potentially could wear out the outsole more quickly because of is more friction more abrasive all the rest of it and the faster that you are running the um the, the higher the level of friction as you hit the ground but you could be a more efficient runner so you could be making beautiful midfoot contact underneath your hips as you're running which would be the perfect running form more or less and therefore the wear is really kind of evenly distributed on the shoe but so i think our advice would be look at the underside of your shoe to see how much you're wearing out different sides of the, the different parts of the rubber and that's a really good injury indicator too potentially that if, if one shoe is massively different to the other then you, you've got a big imbalance that you might want to even if you don't have any pain mm. you might want to go and see someone about um, although don't change if it's not broken, I suppose, but still worth bearing in mind that could. So certainly if you see a big imbalance between your shoes and you're only running once or twice a week and you want to go to run three, four, five times a week, those imbalances will get massively exaggerated the more running you're doing. Also, if you have more than one pair of shoes in rotation, so you've maybe got an older pair and a newer pair, mm -hmm. I would say, do you feel the difference between them? Because that's often what people say. If they only have one pair of shoes in rotation, it's often like, will you feel a massive difference if you get a newer pair? Doesn't necessarily mean that it's time to retire the older pair, but it might be that you swap that into your kind of easy run. Or you said you used to use your old shoes as like gym shoes as well. Yeah, I think I, I could, I had the luxury of, of perhaps running in one pair of shoes and and, and I, I would always mark my shoes as well. So I'd write on the outside of the midsole or, or write somewhere recognizable. So I knew which shoe had come in when. Yeah. And then I obviously had a training, or not obviously, but I did have a training diary. I knew how far I'd run in those shoes. <laughs> this, uh, sorry, this shows how old you are. Strava does that for you now, Andy. Yeah, <laughs> it, it, was, it was a paper training diary. Um, <laughs> to, uh, so it didn't, it didn't shout at me to change my shoes, but it, it meant I could keep track of when I'd put each shoe into rotation. And then I, I had like shoe pair one and two or whatever. And then I knew which one was older. And then the idea was I couldn't really feel the difference. But the moment yeah. I did start to feel the difference, then I knew that was the time for one of them to go. Um, That's mad that you could feel the difference though. Yeah, because I mean, surely I was running so much. I suppose though I had that. I was finally tuned to that. But the, the, at the real extreme, if a shoe has has gone, or maybe it's never as as clear as it having dropped off a cliff. But just putting on a new pair of shoes of the same shoe, and that's that's the, the luxury I had. I was running in the same shoes each time. I see. So they feel so much firmer and more stable. Yeah, or or, or the opposite. Yeah. Sometimes they might have felt more plush and cushioned because the other one, I was almost just going through the foam once it's degraded, like. And just oh, hitting the ground and it's almost slapping and sometimes you could hear it actually i do find it interesting how <clears throat> how it's done on mileage as opposed to time because if you think about like surely if someone's running say we take that four marathon example if yeah. someone's running four marathons in eight hours per marathon yeah. and someone's running four marathons in two hours 30 yeah that's a massive difference there in time on feet yeah, and it's, but, a, it's a total, it's, it's a massive difference in if people's cadence are, does generally sit within a similar range. Mm. So if you're running for twice as long, you've probably taken twice as many steps in those shoes. Yeah. So I guess they have to give it a quantifiable and easy to understand, like roughly you'll yeah. get. And that's the, the takeaway here is every bit of advice, 500 miles, four marathons, whatever the, the individual pair of shoes is, is totally, it's a, it's a generalization. Mm. And if you're easy on your shoes, if you happen to rotate them, if you're, you, you have an efficient stride length, you're not seeing uneven wear underneath, then you're probably going to get quite a lot longer out of your shoes than someone else who sees the opposite and kind of bursts through the toe box on the outside, uh, wears away a section on, on the inside of the outside of the, of the rubber, 
that just shows you that you're going to be slightly hard on your shoes. And you're going to have to take that hit in terms of buying them more frequently. There's also though, if it is the upper that you wear away first, like I know a few people who have like their toes have come through the top maybe yeah. and you're gutted because everything else to do with the shoe is fine. Check out the green runners because they do these little um, like medical kits for your shoes where you yeah. can repair it. So if sustainability is something that you are conscious of and you run a lot, definitely take a look at that because you, you need to prioritize whether it's putting you at risk of injury, but equally from a sustainability angle, you can quite often repair especially as a trail runner yeah you're gonna you're way yeah you might snag quick. shoes and stuff and yeah, yeah and get holes in the upper so have definitely good so they, they can be repaired and then you can also think about donating your shoes once they've reached the end of their life for you you can donate them to charities that will try to do something with them whether they create new like playgrounds or something with them yeah. or whether mm. they repurpose them for people who don't need them for running but but might be able to use them elsewhere and then i guess as a final point at the other extreme of brands it's not just, I mentioned on because I just read it on the box, but most of the super shoes at that level are designed to not last that long, to be as performance focused as possible. But then there are other brands really focused on making their shoes last as long as possible without them feeling super firm or, or sort of heavy and durable. They're trying to get durability through innovations. I spoke to Decathlon recently and they were talking about in the future trying to get all of their shoes to go for a thousand, fifteen hundred kilometers, which would you know wow. make a massive difference. Yeah. So you're listening to the Running Channel podcast. Up next, we have my favorite bit, which is answering your questions. If you do have any more, email them into podcast at therunningchannel.com. And then before that, Sarah and I always bring in a new story, quite varied. <laughs> Sarah, what have you got for us? I've brought in a challenge for you this week. So uh -oh. right when for we me start- For specifically? For you, yeah. So right when we started off the podcast, there was someone who had broken the 10K record with a buggy. It was a lady, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah. 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 Now, Jacob Summer Simmonson has broken the half marathon record- oh, don't make it longer. With a buggy. Any guesses into what time they did it in? An hour and 20 minutes. Oh, hour 20. I think to be under 70 minutes, or under hour 10. Yeah. One hour, eight minutes, and four seconds. What buggy did they have? <laughs> Super buggy. They had a one-year-old. Now, Andy, you might need a younger kid here. So. Yeah, my kids are getting too heavy. Miles is that like, he's not four off three. Um, <laughs> but I might as well have Rick in it. He's so yeah. heavy. I mean, oh. I would happily take that on. Now, that is a challenge in itself that I would love would to you, see. Would you want refreshments? Would you I, want would like a, I would like some Gavi de Gavi. <laughs> Should we just pop it in a little hydration flask before you use it? Some nice body temperature white wine. <laughs> That'll be lovely. Um, yeah, but this guy, absolutely incredible. He'd recently run the Copenhagen Marathon in two hours, 14 minutes and 46 seconds. Maybe oh, he's that's coming at it should... from a quite a high level. Yeah, here. maybe that's where you should start, Andy. What, just run a 2.14 marathon yeah. first, then bring the buggy in? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that sounds straight. That gives you time to get what a, buggy a, did he a, have, a younger Sarah? kid. I don't, I don't know. But one thing that I found super impressive is I was watching videos and there were some yeah. quite tight corners in there. Ooh. You've got the baby leaning. Yeah. Doing instructions. <laughs> was the baby asleep? <laughs> well, Must also, have been asleep. Yeah, that's quite a good attention span for a one-year-old. Yeah. No, no way. Lulled, no into, way. Into, lulled into a gentle yeah. slumber. Yeah. Do you reckon they were allowed any toys in the buggy? Uh, during I'm the race? not letting or Rick have any toys. Would have been great for aerodynamics. He can barely work the buttons. He's got no chance. Well, just get him with the little podcast set up with all the buttons that you can just press as you go yeah. along. That Please make this happen. Today. Please make this happen. <laughs> right, Andy, what's your news story? Yeah. Okay, maybe don't email to ask us to do this. One, we should do 100 metres, me and you first, mate. In the yeah, okay. let's see how it goes. Yeah. Okay, what have you got? My news story, yeah. So it's it's to repeat something that we mentioned very briefly a few weeks ago, but it's, it's I saw an article. That Andy had forgotten until this morning when he checked. <laughs> yes, I checked with Sarah. Can we talk about this? Have I done it already? I can't remember. I'm so old. And uh, it's on letsrun.com. So if you're not familiar with that and, and you're interested in anything mm. to do with track and field, you should check it out. Um, a really long article about the rise of double thresholds. So double threshold interval session days, uh, which doesn't sound that exciting. And both of you are looking at me blankly. Blank face. <laughs> but, but when I was running... Um, uh, I, I ran a lot 12 times a week, but three of them were my hard workouts, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday, broadly. Yeah. Um, but then now what's becoming really prevalent, and this is what the, what's interesting in the article, is it's not just pros. So it's it's something that's been pioneered by Jakob Ingebrigtsen, who's smashing you know, European records, world records at the moment on the track, and he's only 22, um, from Norway, the home of double threshold days. Um, but it's it's been rolled out at like the collegiate level in the US. There's lots of collegiate cross country teams in particular that seem to be trialing this to really good degrees of success. And basically it's at least one, if not two days a week where you do a threshold interval session in the morning. So this is, these are intervals at or just below your lactate threshold and broken up into say four or five minute, maybe it's one mile chunks, mm. it might be six miles of volume in total. Um, and then doing the same again, in the evening on the same day. So it's basically two sessions in one day, which I never could have done because I don't think my body would have would have stood up to it. 
when you hear people doing that, does that make you think, oh, I wish the technology had been around in my day so I could have done that? Or are you secretly like, oh, rather them than me? A bit of both. So <laughs> I, I, I think that, that like what you're touching on there is that one of the reasons cited in the article is that you can do it now and that people didn't do it in my generation or generations before. Partly it was probably, probably because not everyone had thought about it. Um, but as a massive part of it was, I don't think I could have recovered in between. I think mm. that the, the beating... The, the beating that I felt like my body took from interval training, mm. threshold or otherwise, um, was high enough that I needed to do a recovery run later that day, which was very, very easy, very, very light intensity. But the, the super shoes and the foam and the way that people are able to recover now, um, a lot of the athletes are saying it's not beating their bodies up in the same way. So they can do just more yeah. high intensity so volume. It's, it's more about the stuff that's around the sport compared to the training itself, which has changed considerably. Because we joke, but you've not actually, you know, you and he retired a few years ago, five years ago. So do you think the training's changed or is it actually, you know, what comes with running now? I think this is the biggest advance in sports science in terms of, or in terms of coaching science or training to try and integrate these in, into different um, athletes' regimen. And, and different athletes res will respond differently. So I think that they're mm. saying in this, if you're a certain type of athlete with more of an aerobic focus, you'll have a much bigger benefit from it. Um, whereas the more speed focused athletes might not see the same benefit. Ultimately you're trying to shift your aerob anaerobic threshold higher so yeah. you can work aerobically at a greater range of speeds, which is great for everybody, but it's hard to do it. And previously you had to do it with drugs broadly. Like if, if you wanted to be able to recover enough to do extra training that other people in the world weren't doing, you had to take EPO or growth hormone or something that allowed you to kind of bounce back more quickly. Or that was what that's my understanding of why people might have doped. They still had to train really hard and they could arguably potentially train harder than people who weren't cheating. Whereas now the shoes are providing that level of recovery, which allows you to do more hard effort. So yeah, that, that's my, I think it's fascinating. I was sorry, that was a bit of a geeky trip down um, physiology lane. It physiology was a bit lane. geeky, but, but it was quite it. interesting. Yeah. yeah, me and Rick <laughs> couldn't really contribute that much, yeah. but we were nodding <laughs> along. So credit to Let's Run there and a guy called Marius Backen, who back in the late nineties kind of pioneered this training under loads of really cool, very high profile coaches. And then I thought you were going to say back in, in the late 90s. Back in, in the, I could have done a better pun there, I think. Yeah. yeah. But brilliant. So, yeah, lots of people doing lots more training, and I find that fascinating. Very interesting. And now for some questions. And before we get going with today's questions, I'm just going to put a little bit of a shout out into the universe to say, don't. If you could use more of a radio voice, that'd be great. And just before we get going on <laughs> today's not questions. It's to dial it up. Um, <laughs> Very. If you've got an embarrassing running question and you've been thinking for ages, I don't want to ask it on the Running Channel podcast because it should be so obvious and I'm embarrassed that it's screamingly obvious. This is the place to email podcast at theruningchannel.com. We don't mind what your questions are. Don't be scared. Yep. Fire them up. If they're seductive, opulent, creative, or other, or other words that make sense. You know, I understood any, some of those words. Not anything. All. Just throw them <laughs> our way. Also, I know Rick, Rick ran out of vocabulary. Yeah, before Rick runs out. I know Rick loves to know where people are from, but if you prefer us to keep you anonymous, that is absolutely fine as well. Uh, but I do want to know where you're from. Yeah, safe space, <laughs> safe space, no stupid questions. <laughs> Robert from The Hague in the Netherlands has emailed to say, on the topic of splits, I constantly hear about positive and ne negative splits, but how about flat pace? I do try to keep a steady pace on the long runs and settle into a nice constant minute to kilometer ratio. Now, this is intriguing because we do always talk about it, but actually keeping a flat pace would be the dream. That would be what we could do if we could all pace correctly and work at it, but it's just incredibly hard to keep a that pace which is probably why we try to do negative splits yes, exactly mm. that yeah it's so hard i'm currently doing a 30 day 5k challenge and with the runner app and a lot of the kind of like pre blurb to the workout is mm. like try to keep this really consistent pace yeah which is perfect for me because that's the thing that i am worst at <laughs> yeah i think i think we play it safe by saying people should do a negative split as like the holy grail because i think that you can lose so much more time in the long run if you set off too fast you could set off 30 seconds too fast through a mm. certain point in a, in a race and then lose way more than 30 seconds later on because you hit the wall or, or just you just tank yeah but it's really hard to know exactly where your red line is and run a perfect consistent pace which is why we would recommend a negative split to give yourself that little bit of headroom where you can push harder in the second half and actually speed up a little bit but here uh, robert's actually i think talking about general long runs and i think that's the time to learn 
yeah. how to really dial into a very specific pace and actually learn that skill. Um, and to, so ideally, you'll have to use technology probably to gauge it to start with, but to get, a point, get to the point where you can do it by feel. Yeah, it is so hard though to do it with with or without technology. I would say Sarah and I recently did a a, a negative splits challenge. I had to over get faster. Every one we had to get right? faster without technology, but we were allowed to use a watch on the first K. And actually, trying not to push yourself, say an extra twenty seconds per kilometer, is so hard because once you do that, you're then at that pace, and you'd have to try and push yourself further. So trying to make those small incremental drops. It is so difficult, but like you say, Andy, being tuned into yeah. your pacing, if, you go, if you've got that skill, then embrace it. And that's also in a skill that elites spend a lot of time working on. Like yeah. We've got a video coming out with Chris Thompson, who ran 2.11 at London Marathon. Yeah. And he was saying that like a massive part of his training is using the watch data after the runs to see yeah. how close he is. And he'll go out and run one run in the morning, and time it and then he'll go out in the evening and try and do the exact same time but without his watch yeah and wow. and that's mm. because when you're running really long races as well like in a marathon you don't want to be checking your watch every five seconds and in a 5k you probably feel like you won't you can't because you want to just keep everything the same yeah and if you've ever seen like the f1 engineers formula one engineers give their drivers feedback they'd be like oh you lifted here off, off, off the accelerator or whatever you know 0. 0.001 too early mm. or you know it's a tiny fractions of a of a thing that they need to be aware of and, the, and elite runners spend so much time running at or around their race pace they should get a good feel for it and so the more time you can spend right at that pace and, and dialing it in then the more fine-tuned you can get to doing it exactly by feel so to talk about those double thresholds really quickly that i mentioned I, in the article it says that the runners through lactate testing, so they're taking samples from their ear or their finger on their runs, they then reduced their pace by about four seconds per mile, which, you know, two two or three seconds per kilometre. Mm. And then that, that had a huge difference in their ability to recover from the sessions. So like, wow. that's how finely tuned it is. Interesting. And also a negative split, when we did it as a challenge, we did the extreme version where every single kilometre you get faster. But a negative split in, in a race simply is just making sure that the second half is faster than the first half. So that if that is, you keep a consistent pace throughout and then that last like couple of kilometres mm -hmm. maybe get a bit faster, that still counts. But you're still having that consistent pace throughout the rest of the race. So learn your race pace. Paul Clark from Leeds has emailed to ask a question for you regarding my 5k time. I've done a sub 20 a few times in the last year, but I just can't get back to it. Currently around sub 21 at the moment. I always have a sprint in me. I can really speed up in the last 200 meters. If I have energy for the last 200 meters, when should I try and push earlier in the 5k? I mean, I when I read this, I, I just thought, I get it. But we do have our ups and downs and there may be external factors in how we run because one, you know, one six months uh, might be in the winter. And we would know from last week's pod that heat makes a big change yeah. in how we run. Uh, maybe he did all those, you know, when it was 14 degrees, still perfect conditions, late autumn, early spring, when weather factors yeah. on a big deal. There's other factors apart from actually your personal uh you know, record time and how well you're running at the moment that can come into play. Also yeah. as well, it depends what you've been training for. Because yeah. I know when I first started running, I'd hit maybe like a PB in a park run. And then that was the the benchmark of like, ask me on any day and I can go out and run this time. But as, as, as I've got closer and closer to what is my limit, I ran a 44 something 10K last year. I, there has not been a day this year where you could have asked me to run that and I would have been able to do it. So I've been training it, for something else. Yeah, because I've yeah. been training for something completely different. And so I think as well, if that if that is your kind of absolute eight weeks of training to get that 5K, bam, you've got it. That doesn't necessarily mean that it's guaranteed. Yeah, I think there's three things that come into play here, like fitness, which is what you're saying. So are you still training for exactly the same thing? And if you are training for a different goal, then your fitness will have shifted slightly. Then there's conditions, which Rick touched on. So the the temperature, um, humidity, all of those things are going to mm. weigh Terrain, on. Terrain, hills. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, the court is the course the same. And then the third one is psychology, so the mentality of approaching it. And I think there's a – we just did a video, actually. So do check out a video that we just made, which is me running a sub-20-minute 5K and talking you through all of the things that you should be considering at various points. So there's some good stuff in there about bringing your focus back onto your running form or your breathing or whatever it might be at key parts of the run. 
And that can help to keep you kind of more mindful of what's happening during the run and stop your pace from drifting and keeping you on track. But then ultimately the third or from three to four kilometers, rather the fourth kilometer is the most important part where you have to dig deeper just to maintain the same pace. And that's something that can be really difficult mentally, regardless of how fit you are. And that could be something that you've just not switched on properly, but broadly the cue I would use or tell people to use is, is to treat it as an opportunity. So Mm. it's not, oh my goodness, this has got hard. I don't want to do it. Or I don't want to have to push harder just to maintain the same pace. That's a bit depressing. Make peace with that before you start. That's going to happen. And then every time that it gets difficult, you're like, this is my opportunity. This is my opportunity to run under 20 minutes or whatever anyone else listening might be as their goal time. Um, it's it's just shifting, flicking a switch in your brain to, to not be like, this is hard. I don't want to do it. It's like, this is my chance. Mm. I've got to jump on this chance now. And also accepting like how much harder it will feel to maintain that pace as well. Because yeah. it can oh, yeah. be quite demoralizing when you like you see 4K flash up on your watch and it's yeah. literally the exact same pace as 3K, but it feels so much harder. Like yeah. that's totally normal in a 5K. I it's always look gutting. at my watch and think, oh, I remember the day when I ran my 5K PB. I'm now at the tree at the top of the park and about 400 meters away from the finish. <laughs> <laughs> hey, yeah, me, me, I me literally, both. I me think both, that. Mate. Every week, every <laughs> week, I think that. Yeah, you know, so if I if I ever run a sub twenty um five k, I'd just retire on that. I'd just be like, right, great, I'm done. You know, what? I don't want to go back there. I don't think you would though. Don't you think? No, the I think every, every, see, every, you know? as soon as well, let's see. Andy and I've got a WhatsApp group called Rick Sub Twenty Five K. We have, yeah. Have you? Yes, yeah. Have. This is from several years ago, pre surgery, right? Yeah, yeah. But I did think that it was possible then. Who knows what's possible now, but don't, you yeah. know, no human is limited, as Kipchoge would say. I guarantee you would get a 1959 and be like, right, Olympics. Olympics. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, aim high. Get one, me to Paris. One more contract in me. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Amazing. <laughs> yeah. Well, you have been listening to the Running Channel podcast. We've done it. We've got we through another it. week. Yeah. Success. If you do have any questions, please do email in podcast at the and we will see you next time.